I came back to the language when I was 23, 24. I had just finished my undergrad uh, Western. I went to Queens to become a teacher and I'm sitting in a bar in Hamilton, Ontario. And I can take, I, I was just discussing with family. So I can take uh, language from, uh, I can take Anishinaabemowin. I can take any Haudenosaunee language I, I want. I can't learn Lenape. So at that point, I made a, a point to, at my parents' chagrin because I didn't get a job. I went back to university and uh, went back to Western and I made the point of traveling Highway 2 all the way back down to Moravian Town to learn from the, at that point, I think was the last first language speaker, but I might be wrong. Um, so I learned from Diane Snake over uh, a few uh, years and bugging her at lunchtime. Um, and that sort of set me on my course of learning Lenape language. And from that point, I got a job as a teacher, you know, three hours away. So I'm learning at a distance now. And I did a lot of work uh, independently. So using the dictionary, uh, as I shared this morning, my mom was an ESL teacher. And she's a very particular teacher in terms of how she, she's very structured. But she gave me some tips in terms of how to learn language um, because she's teaching Vietnamese, she's teaching uh, army officers from all over the world how to, how to learn English. So she was able to give me some tips in terms of second language learning. So fast forwarding to what, almost 25 years later, here I am. Um, I've been able to learn from others along the way, which has been nice, mostly from uh, Moravian Town. Um, and then with Karen and I in the last, I'm going to say five years, we've tried to build a program at Muncie because as I'm sure the language people behind me will say, their services are always in demand and they're pulled in 8 million different directions and they can't, they can't support every request. So the hard lifting uh, Karen and I decided we wanted to really make sure there was something for our community. For post-secondary institutions like Princeton or for other universities, you can support by uh, developing partnerships with community. You have a wealth of resources. You have a wealth of, uh, some say money, right? As much as you may have to write grants to get that money, but you have that power and you have that ability to work in this circle of sifting through policy and practice that governments do and post-secondary does in order to support language programming on community, developing that understanding and, and reciprocity. You know, to give you an example, my goal would be to have our local university have a language program so that kids can access it all the way from daycare, from the minute they're born, all the way to a post-secondary if they choose to. But that requires money. And Indigenous languages are only funded by grants in Ontario and in Canada. So you got to write your grants every two years or every one year to get like a mere pittance to run your program. Whereas, you know, a wealthy university that just builds their brand new alumni center or something like that could really support in terms of the weight and the, and the ability to navigate in that to support languages. I'm going to stop there because I'm going to keep talking. And she. I was going to call Velma up here because she hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> um, I can just, uh, some of the things I may have forgot to say today about the journey with the language um, was all the pitfalls of working without money. Um, it's hard to be dedicated when everyone has told you we got to work, we got to support families, and we have no money to devote to language. Um, we finally got a tribal council government that funded one position and teachers for online teaching. But it's only, you know, one hour or half an hour a week. You, you just can't learn it in that short a time. And those of you that take online classes, you know how difficult it is. Um, we did know a few words growing up. Grandma had a word for shut up your head. And um, we learned to count from one to five. So 
our parents did what they could. But you know, we're from out here and we got moved so many times. We got moved seven times before we got to where we are in Wisconsin. In fact, getting moved three times in Wisconsin. And it, they just, you know, it was survival. More, more emphasis on survival. So they did the best they could. I thought that my values, which I know are my native values, came from the church. I didn't have that understanding because we all had to go to church. But my, my dad didn't, wondered why. He said, I pray in my own way, which is out in the woods. And most of our men say that. Um, and that's broke down now, too. Our churches are falling down because they don't have enough people. We, we have the big house now. So now we need even more language to conduct. Uh, you know, we're all trying to bring it back. And um, we can pray in our language to a degree. And um, to speak, to get up there and speak and tell a story in the language, first of all, might be difficult even for the best teacher, but the rest of us wouldn't catch it all. So it's it's just a process. We've been at this for 30 years or more. What I, I think I said that this morning that I envision, because they're teaching Muncie and Mohican now. <laughs> That's a whole, another story, but there are those that only want to learn Mohican because they want to be pure. I made the decision to, to learn Muncie because there were speakers. So I could go to Moravian Town and Muncie and work with speakers. So I knew it was first language teaching. And um, we learned a lot. So I said, learn Muncie then Mohican will come easier for you. Well, now we're finding, they're, they're beginning to see, and with they, I mean my people, um, they're beginning to see that the languages are very similar. So at one point, we'll be talking Muncie Mohican, <laughs> a mixture of both. So um, if I may go out of your lineup, I want to call on my language teacher in our community, Nicole Miquin. I am. <laughs> oh, good job, Sarah. <laughs> um, Pinganawan Oman, Nina Shinbe Miquin, AKA Nicole Pikor. This is my aunt Molly. She's actually um, the one who her and my aunt Sheila kind of were the ones who started me on my language journey when I was a little bitty girl. When they started learning, um, they just talked and whatever kids picked up, they kept at them. And then her her son that passed when he was a teenager. Me and him were probably the only two who used language um, at that age. So any chance we got, we would talk to each other, go hide in a corner and talk. And it just kept going, kept going. And I guess that's just my path and what was put in my my direction. I just kind of wanted to add to what she was saying. So our community is unique. We come from the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohica Nation. Um, that name says a lot. The Stockbridge is the government name given to us. Uh, Muncie people joined up with the Mohica Nation as we were on those in one of those seven stops or in several of those seven stops. So. Um, Contrary to what history will tell you, uh, Mohican was last spoken in our community in the 70s. Um, she's a history buff, but I know this because my great grandpa spoke the language, yeah, and his brothers, um, but secretly, quietly. So there was a lot of words and phrases of Mohican language that were passed down. Now, in our community, we have Mohican people and Muncie people and Mohican Muncie people. Some people identify only Mohican, some people identify only Muncie, and some people identify as both. Um, so it, it, it is uh, confusing. 
some of the things that I learned about the Muncie language, though, um, I don't know why, but Muncie is called to me, and uh, I support the Mohican learners, and I I attend their classes, and um, until recently, I was the the Muncie teacher there, and worked um, hand in hand with the Mohican teacher, and we decided when we took those positions on that we were going to go on the forefront and support one another. And um, so we would talk to each other, me using Muncie and him using Mohican. And, and sometimes it would get a little confusing, but for the most part, we could understand each other and communicate with one another. Um, a lot of things though, that I learned about the Muncie language, and I've heard this before earlier today when they were talking about Muncie language being the grandfather language of the Algonquin speaking people. I find this to be true in traditional oral history stories and and just listening through conversations. Um, one of the things the Mohican linguist that we work with had, he kept trying to explain it to me and explain it to me. And I'm like, I don't understand linguists. You know, I don't understand what how you're trying to say it to me. I said, can you show me? So he got out a piece of paper and he drew a box and he put the vowel system of the Muncie language on the corners of each part of the box. And then on the line part of the box, he put the Mohican vowel system. And he said, the Muncie vowel system is stable. The Mohican vowel system is moves up and down. So for the last 500 years or since contact, since we've been able to document, the Muncie language has not changed. The sounds are the same. So being the grandfather language of the Algonquin speaking people, it's important to preserve it. And with our community not having fluent speakers, only one speaker from the Moravian town, um, the Muncie community is learning as well. And then the families that are left out here in the East, um, that is my goal. I left my job so that I could take on this and save it so that we're not going backwards. And um, I haven't been able to talk to you yet, but <laughs> I've been I've been picking at at Kristen's ear, and I'm I'm staying out here, and I'm hoping to work with all the universities and anybody else who's willing to put in a little elbow grease and um, start documenting, We're making talk, talking dictionaries and um, making databases and starting language groups, not just for people who want to become teachers, but for the teachers themselves. We need support too. Um, Kristen's currently one of my teachers, well, until I quit my job, but she said she'll keep teaching. Uh, my Aunt Molly taught me as a kid. Um, we find teachers in everybody, you know, and so um, I hope from this, which was an amazing opportunity, thank you, Susan, um, we're able to create that group so that we can preserve what still exists. And um, I know you were talking, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Karel, I know you were talking about utilizing other um, Algonquin languages and Muncie being so close to, uh, is it a Unami dialect? I think it's a, okay. So in between somewhere? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in Wisconsin, we actually work with the Ojibwe and the Menominee tribes. Um, there's a nonprofit organization called Menominee U. They're both Algonquin speaking tribes that actually broke away from the tribe so that they could go further um, in preserving their language, which is what we are kind of modeling off our, our program and in Stockbridge from. Um, but starting to utilize not just the Muncie speakers, but the, the, the project I'm working on is for solely for Muncie, but utilizing all these other languages to create a database. The linguist that we work with, his name is Chris Harpy for the Mohican language. Now he's not I just pick his brain when I can. He's, you know, I work with Kristen back and forth, but um, I'll pick his brain to understand the linguistics of it. And he has a database that took him 17 years to create. In that database, it's all the Algonquin languages of words that are documented or spoken. I want to do the same thing for the Muncie language. And Kristen has got a lot of work already created. Um, and everybody else here, I'm sure, has materials as well because the only way that we're gonna save it is if we do something now.
Um, so there's a lot that Princeton and other universities can do to support us and help us in, in preserving the Muncie language, which is extremely important for all Algonquin languages. Nishi. me. <laughs> um, um, and the Shisha and Koyan, Kristen Jacobs, Ashin Zion, Shakenda, Hilanik Zion, Nina Minitoi, Ashin Zion, Loanach and Ochwe, um, Nonjiai, Alnapawi, Lakawit, um, Dami Minzi, Weech Jow, Nidach and Nini Shuakwisak, and Nakawa Shin Zuak. Barry, walk Jacob. Um, Barry within Tikdom, Nalananika, walk Jacob within Tikdom, Hosh. Um, Nida look at Nahi Ridge Elementary Schooly, Schooly Con. Um, so I'm just sharing a little bit of Delaware with you um, um, for the fellow language teachers. Um, I um, just shared a general greeting. Um, how to say my name in English is Kristen. My name, my spirit name is Northwind. I'm from Delaware Nation. Um, I'm a wolf clan. I have two sons. Their names are Barry and Jacob. Barry's 15 and my other son, Jacob, is eight. And I'm a Delaware language teacher at Nahi Ridge Elementary in Ridgetown, Ontario. So Nahi is the school that um, our, the students from our community go to. And I've been teaching there since I think 2015. Um, I teach grades one to eight uh, up until last year. Nicole was my first adult student. Um, but we've we've had a lot, we've had a really good connection and um it's it's definitely different teaching an adult um than teaching children um i know there's always like there's always that stigma about um having our language in the schools and you know that like we're not going to produce fluent speakers by only having students in your class for 30 to 40 minutes a day and uh, when I first started teaching, I thought, you know, like, that wasn't true, that I could do it, but <laughs> that's um, not quite there. But I found other ways around it to use the time that I do have with them every day um, to the best of my ability. Uh, we um, were kind of like in a technological stage with our with our youth they all have cell phones and social media accounts and uh, all those things play into the classroom and um, so yeah, I just I have to find new ways of, of getting them speaking so I use a lot of online quiz games um, when and I found even using online quiz games like uh, they would have to know the word to see it to answer the question and so then they got to be where okay you know maybe they're just memorizing the word they've seen it so many times and um so one of the sites I used this year came out with um like where I could say the word or the phrase and then either like give them a picture of it happening or a sentence in English or something for them to to choose um to choose their answer. And I found that to be more effective than just, just simply seeing words. Um, I've, I've been successful, I think, in all, all areas of, um, well, maybe not all areas, but um, I've felt like I've studied our language a lot. And I found that um, when I used to work with, um, with Velma, she used to talk about um, something called blood memory. And she would say like how um, our language was inside of us. And I could never understand that until, <laughs> I can understand it now. And I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional about that, but it's, it's taken probably a good 10 years to get to 
like where Delaware is starting to become like my first reaction thought about something or saying it to somebody and like there was times in my learning that I didn't think I would get to this point <laughs> um it, it can get frustrating um like when you talk about like how a big school like this can be um how can you be um resourceful like be a resource to us and um like with our language program for example like if you want to learn your language like you you have to spend your whole day um thinking speaking reading writing like all of that like to really to really get to a really comfortable point in speaking and there's, there just isn't resources like that out there for anybody right now um I mean we had we have the program in Moravian Town where we took students. Um, that was a pr program that I was part of where we were able to sit with a speaker all day, um, five days a week, or actually it started out three days a week. And then we found out that three days a week wasn't really effective because then you would go home on the weekend and then you would have Monday and Tuesday, and then you're back in class Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Mm. So we decided to change that to five days a week. And when that change happened, I was working, um, I had just started working as a Delaware teacher and uh, I asked if I could take a year off so I could go and sit there every day with them and um, they approved it. They approved it and um, I think that that year helped. Um, I think I, I went off track of what I was talking about, but um, I was talking about how like institutions like this can be um, helpful to us and having uh, events like this really, um, really brings a lot of us together and gives us the chance to meet other people who are trying to do the same things as us. And, and I've heard um, a few different speakers like talk about how like you just get pulled in so many different directions and you want to help everybody, but you can't. And you want to like, you know, kind of stay focused on, you know, like my own teacher, Diane, she's always telling me, you know, like stay focused. You're there to teach language to our youth and, you know, don't be trying to go off track like where I am today. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have to look at it like, you know, um, I want to come and meet these other people who are doing the same things as I am because we need more, well, I think the terms language champions now, you know, um, ones that want to learn their language and, you know, we need to get our kids back outside again and out of those classrooms. Like it took me to actually become a teacher in a classroom to see how ineffective the classrooms are for our for our um, youth. I feel like um, them spending time in our own community first, like learning our language and our our way of life um, and just getting a good handle on themselves before being put into this classroom like this. <laughs> um, my, um, my youngest son is really struggling with school. Um, he's only in grade three and um it's it's too much for him it's loud and uh like classrooms are different today and I think it's because of technology like technology is a like I've noticed just in the last seven years that I've been in the classroom um like just how much student behavior have changed because of it like you need like that um flashy surprise happening every two seconds like the videos do and you know you can't sometimes always give that to them but um you just like I said work around it try and find things that they like to do um get outside you know get our kids back in the bush and um you know learn how to how to live outside like what what would happen you know like if our digital world were to crash um like before I come up here, me and Nicole, I was showing her some of my notes and things that I've been put together. And I know it seems really old, but like, I always think of, you know, what happens if like, I have all these things saved in clouds and 
if it's all gone, like it would take a lot of work to put back together. And um, I just want a good, um, something to pass down to my children and something that they can share going forward. That's all I have to say, I guess. Before I start, I'm going to acknowledge um, all my teachers, um, the ones that are gone and the ones that are still here. Um, uh, Stella Stonefish, Marjorie Logan, Matty Huff, Glenn Jacobs, Diane Snake, Rita Huff, uh, Alma Bragoon, and Ruby Jacobs, and uh, Vernon Stonefish. Um, I uh, My first account of uh, hearing language was probably when I was about three or four years old. My grandfather lived next door to us, and he would babysit us sometimes. And I remember one time, I didn't remember this till I was about 30, but I remember we were waiting for him to get home. And when he got home, he said, come on in the house. And I rarely heard my grandfather speak English and he lived with his brother. So his brother, my uncle Jim always, I never heard him ever speak English. So, and that's all we spoke was English. My mom went to residential school, so she wasn't raised with the language. Uh, my father never went to residential school and his mother was a fluent speaker, but he never taught us the language. So one one night or one evening, my grandfather says, you know, come on in the house. So he sits me down at the table and I don't know where my sister was. I don't know. We're like opposites. I never know where she was. <laughs> anyway, so I remember sitting at the table and he opened the fridge and he pulled everything out, set it all on the table. And in the language, he said to me, everything. And after he got done saying it, he said, Kiha kana notaman which means, do you understand me? And me being three, four years old, I felt like I knew what he said. And, and I just went like that, shook my head, yeah. And he's, it made him so happy, he smiled. And I never remembered that till I was about 30 years old. So, um, when I started to relearn language, um, I remembered that. I remembered that exact day and I remembered every single item on that table. And I said, I know those words because my grandfather took the time, even though it was two minutes, three minutes, he took the time to teach me that. So that's actually the switch that was flicked on for me because I wasn't born to hear the language immediately like we should be. He did that and, and I remember that. So he actually opened that doorway for me. And um, when I started to have my own kids, you know, you look at your kid and you think, you know, man, you're so beautiful. You know, I made that, you know, and then you think, what could I give you? What could I give you? That would be the most awesomest gift. And you think, well, I'll take care of you. I'll do this for you. And then you think, but that's not really a gift. That's your job because you're a mom. So you have to do that. And then I start thinking and I thought, I, I would really love to give you the language. That's exactly what I thought, but I didn't know enough. So growing up, just like Kristen said, we had language till senior kindergarten and we never got it in the public school. I remember things like dog, pig, cat, ween butt, you know, and those are the words I wasn't going to choose to say to a newborn baby. Like I need more. I need to know more. <laughs> so, you know, and I had it, my first child when I was 17. So, you know, and I started to have more and each time I had one, that's exactly what I thought again. And I, and it would make me emotional because I started to feel like what kind of um, Lenape are you if you can't even speak your language? So that's what I felt like. So I changed it. And it, it didn't really start moving until I went to college. I went to college at AEI in Muncie. And we had a language course, actually. 
And in the back of my mind, language was always there. It was always there. And it would come forward every once in a while. And I'd think about it and really wish that I knew it. And, and then it would go away. And then it would come back again. So when I was in college, um, we had an assignment. And we had this language class. And our assignment was, you know, you need to go back to your community, learn a, a song in a language, and come back and teach it to the class. That was our assignment. So that was actually how it all started. And then upon graduation, you had to do a four month place and everybody was going to the social work field. So, you know, everybody wants to help everybody. Everybody wants to help your community. So I was going that way too, but I, I just, something about it didn't, I didn't feel right. You know, like, do I got to follow everybody over here? Like, do, is this where I really want to be? You know, I started to question those things. And then I went to sleep at night and, you know, I pray and offer my tobacco and what, you know, why do I feel the way I do? And then a light bulb switched. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, I could actually learn a language for four months while everybody goes into social work. I could learn my language. That's what I'm going to do. But before this happened, I literally cried for three days every single day about the language. So I actually grieved over not knowing it. And this time it never went away, you know, like how it would go away and then come back. It never, ever left after that. So I went to the language part department and, you know, I wasn't the most welcome person there, but I was pretty pushy. Like, I got to do this. Like, I'm not going to graduate, you know, kind of thing. So she's like, yeah, okay. So this is when, when things started to be really, um, they, I'm saying learning language is probably the, the hardest thing you could ever do, but it's also the most rewarding. So there were days I had to learn, I had, to, she spoke language to me from 9 a.m. to 3.30 every single day. And then at, at 4.30 when it was time to go, she said, here's a tape, here's a paper, listen to it, and I'll see you in the morning. So that's exactly what I did. I did that every day for four months. And about, and, I, and she'd come back and say, say things to me, and I'd have to see if I, you know, she would quiz me. And, I, and sometimes I couldn't even bring the words out of my mouth properly. I couldn't even pronounce them. And I would get frustrated and I wanted to give up. I did. I was like, I can't do this. It's too hard. But I really, really wanted to. So I would get up in the morning and I would go back. And about the third month mark, all of a sudden something just switched. And I was like, oh my God, I know what that means. I know what you're saying. I know the sounds. I can, I can figure out what's happening. That was a huge uh, encounter, like it was like, oh my God, I know, I, you know, so I would just literally, all those blocks that I put on my own self, which was my own ego, oh, you can't do it, it's too hard, that's ego, you know, I went this long without it, uh, I should be okay, that's ego, so I had to look at myself and say, okay, why is this so hard, you know, you know, and trying to, you know, argue with my own self about what I should do, where I should be, who I should become, all these things. And I finally said, you know, like, as soon as that happened, it just literally took everything, all the ego, all the blocks that I put there myself, gone. So I felt like an open book, anything after that just flowed in. And I remembered stuff fast. You know, I just it sped everything up. And then, like I said, language journey is the hardest thing you could go through, then it become, you know, humanness got in the way you know not necessarily my own other people's and and again I would leave the language building crying because somebody thought they knew it was best for me and I didn't I just wanted to keep learning you know I'll be your best friend if you teach me the language like I would do everything and I did I was like not treated the best I would be not allowed to talk to people and I wouldn't because well if you don't like them then you know as long as you can teach me you know like I I learned that's like that's not good, but I did it because I wanted the language so bad. Then it came a time where I was like, you know, I need to, I need to go somewhere. So I went, my dad at the time was still alive and I went crying to him because I cried a lot. <laughs> and as you can tell, <laughs> anyway, so my dad said, you know, there's, there's lots of people out there that know language, you know? And I was like, really? Who? So he started telling me all these names and I literally had 10 people on my hand. He said, maybe they haven't spoke for 40 years, but they were raised with the language. They know the language. You go see them, go see your grandma. She knows it. And I was like, what really? Yep. She does go see your aunt Margie. She knows it. 
So that's what I did. I went from door to door. And sometimes I would get turned away. I don't know what, come back another day. And I did, I went back the next day. I was very persistent. And then later on, they just open the door <laughs> and go in the kitchen. <laughs> they wouldn't even open it for me. They would just open the big door and, you know, so then we start having tea and I just started with little phrases at a time. Do you remember anything in language? No, I don't. That's every single one of them answered that. And I said, hey, I learned this new phrase. Do you, you know, do you mind if I tell you to see if maybe I'm not saying it right? Yeah, go ahead. Got the week wam shung ah. Oh, say it again. Say it slower. Got the week wam shung ah. Yeah, I know what that means. You can also say it this way. That's literally how it started. One phrase, one word, and then we just started to exchange. And then I then I'd go to more people and more people. Once I had them on my side. We were all besties after a while. I literally said, hey, let's go have lunch. So I, and this is before, like, we got funding and stuff, but this is before any of that even happened. I would use my own money and take them out for lunch. And we'd sit in a restaurant, and they just fed off of each other. They started to say one thing, and then the other lady would laugh, and she would say, so they, so I just got to sit there and listen. So they told lots of stories um, about things like my grandfather used to say. So, you know, we're talking 200 years ago. That's the language they're talking about. I got to hear that. And all the stories um, that happened in the community at that time. So one by one, they slowly pass away. And I know this day is going to come. Um, and I, I, I actually had a dream about each and every one of them, knowing that their days were going to come. So I got my own self ready, as ready as I could be. You're never ready when the day comes. But, you know, I still honor them. I still pray. I still I feed them feast time when they're gone. I still feed them because they offered me, they gave me so much and they don't even realize how much that they gave me. Like everything about life is different when you know the language. You, you're different. You see the world differently. It changes who you are and that's who we're supposed to be. So anyways, okay, I taught daycare, kindergarten, elementary, high school. I taught at Fanshawe one year. I've taught a lot of kids, a lot of different ages, and I'm getting a little bit older and not so fond of the little ones anymore. <laughs> you know, um, I, I do, of course, when each, I have uh, six grandchildren, when they were born, um, I, I made sure that's the first language they heard. So if I was in a hospital, this is the plan, the birth plan. You know, we had to make sure the nurses and everybody knew this is what soon as soon as the baby takes its first breath, the first thing they're going to hear is my voice. And, and I would tell the, the baby who I was, I was her grandmother, um, you know, some things like I'll always be here for you. This is your language. I love you. And I'm glad you're here. Every single one of them. So since COVID hit, I just had a new granddaughter. She's just turned one. I couldn't go to the hospital. So um, thank God for FaceTime. So that's what we did. There, her dad, my son had FaceTime, called me, just, you know, I seen her actually be delivered and I seen her take her first breath. And as soon as she cried, I spoke and believe it or not, she quit crying because she heard me. So I didn't get to see her right away, probably till she was a week and a half old or something. And I went and seen her. And so every time I see her, I was, she, she knows who I am. She knows my voice. So she might not see me for a month. They live in six nations, but she knows my voice. So the, the other part of uh, language learning I find is the best is by oral communication. Um, you know, I know the writing system is important. However, maybe down the road when you know the language really, really, really well, you can understand everything being said, answer back, then you can introduce the writing system. That way you never forget. So that's how I learned the quickest. And there's a program called Language Apprentice Program. Some of you has probably heard about it. It's where you pair the language learner up with the elder. So that's what we did for three. Well, actually, it wasn't just three years. It was, you know, I did it prior to getting funding. Just I was able to give them money for coming and feeding them and things at the end. But that is a, that's a really good um, thing to do. Um, and the other part is, you know, uh, actually, what is immersion? You know, like I hear we're having an immersion camp. It's like, well, immersion doesn't mean we're going to talk about the language for three days in a row, every day, all day about the language. We're talking in the language. That's immersion. 
there's no lang there's no English translation. You're just speaking and you're listening and you're feeling because it is spirit. The creator gave you the language. And like Kristen said, it is blood memory. You, you, when you're born, you already have that language in you because you're Lenape. So the spirit, you know, you makes you, sends you into the world as a Lenape child. You have that language. You're a fluent speaker as a baby. It's just parents and grandparents' responsibility to flick that switch on. And we can't because a residential school and all these other things that has happened. But that's originally how it is. So you can't, you know, I, I can't learn my language. Yeah, you can because you're Lenape. You can do it. You're Haudenosaunee. You can do it. Anishinaabe, whatever. You can do it because that's who we are. The creator made sure there's a way. So, and like I said, spirit is, language is spirit driven, which is means, you know, it's not always in a book, you know, where's your tobacco, your tobacco, pray to the creator. I need help to learn my language. You know, help me to learn my language and you will get the help. You, you know, that they did everything they could for us, seven generations so that we could still be here. We're not wiped out. We're not stupid people. We're smart people and we can learn a language. That's all I have to say. Anishik. Quinginawa Lomwa, Ninda Shinzi, Karal Hall, Ninonjiayi, Nantakoking, Nabalotman, Wendak Takwach. This morning, I introduced myself in Nanakoke. So, for balance, this afternoon, I wanted to introduce myself in Munsi because I've been learning these languages side by side for a couple of years now. And um, it's been a great journey and very confusing at the same time because, you know, these languages are. Um, they're very similar to each other. And so, you know, half the time when I'm talking, I end up doing some combination of both of the languages, which I actually think is not a terrible thing. And I feel that my ancestors would have spoken, having ha having both Nanakoke and Lenape ancestors, they would have spoken and understood both of these languages. And, you know, I think it's a perfectly natural thing to, you know, um, go between them. So my language journey with Nanakoke, I didn't have the ability to learn it as a kid. And no one in our community has had that opportunity because we don't have any language speakers yet. Um, so when I graduated from college and I moved to DC to work, I was only um, a couple of hours away from our community. And so I spent a lot more time, um, you know, out there driving over there. And I knew that there were some elders in the community that were working on revitalizing our language. And I didn't really know much about it. I knew Wanishi. That was that was about all I knew. And so I just kind of started showing up and just trying to see, you know, what was there? What could I do? What can I help? What can I learn? And um, particularly during the pandemic is when I really had the chance to do a lot more language work, both with Nanakoke and with Muncie, because it's so hard to carve out that time. You know, everybody's working full-time jobs and you really do need to dedicate that time to the language, but there's so many distractions out there that you kind of just get, you know, caught up in life, but the pandemic really, you know, it slowed everything down. And so it was, a chance it was all and everything moving online also helped me to join the Muncie language class because I had heard about it actually two years prior but I couldn't physically travel to New Jersey um, and certainly not up to Ontario uh, where they were having the in-person classes but once they moved them onto Zoom I was able to take part in that and it was really great to see how how one even teaches a language to people, because that's not something I knew, but I knew that we were working on bringing Nanakoke back. And so I wanted to figure out, well, how can I help teach it to other people? What are some, how can I learn this? And so I spoke a little bit this morning about how, you know, one of the elders in our community envisioned this language book, and that's where we've kind of started out working with Nanakoke. 
Um, one of the other things I actually forgot to mention about the book, um, one of the integral parts of the book, is that it's not just a physical book. Um, it's also an audio book, um, specifically because our languages are oral languages. Like you said, they're meant to be spoken and they're meant to be heard. And they can't, they're not solely going to live on only in writing. And so it's really important to make sure that people, you know, can hear that language spoken. And so we were like, okay, well, we want to make sure we have an audio book, but who's going to record it? Like who, who's going to, you know, say these words? Cause we're all starting at the beginning. And so, you know, that's what we did. We've been working with a linguist to help us um, both bring some of the the words on that are in these ancient dictionaries, um, you know, sort of uh, pull them off the pages. So that linguist, his name is Keith Cunningham. Um, he's probably on the Zoom, I think. Uh, so if you're there, hi, Keith. But, um, and then, you know, working on reconstructing other words that aren't in that dictionary. And we would sit there and we we put them together. Um, sometimes we're sitting there making decisions about how we're even gonna describe things that we don't have words for, especially contemporary things. You know, how can we describe half the things in this room? You know, a 300 year old dictionary is not gonna help us do that. And so, you know, sitting there trying to make those decisions. Um, and so we'd get some of these words and I would just take my phone and I'd record those words um, and their meaning in my, um, you know, in my little voice recorder. And then I would text those out to different people in the community. And so they could start, you know, learning while I'm learning at the same time. And so, you know, just sending them out to different people in the community. And we had, I had another elder who told me, you know, he was, he said, I'm really interested in you working on this language revitalization, but this is going to be really for the children. He's like, you know, I, I, he's like, I'm too old to learn a new language at this point. I can't learn this, but I'm really happy that you're doing it. And, you know, I want this to be something, you know, that the children are going to have. But two years later, this exact same elder, he's now introducing himself in Nanakoke when we go to events, he can say, you know, how are you? Like my name is, and a few other phrases. And I think that's something that he didn't imagine for himself. And I think it's really important that it shows that our languages are not, um, we don't have to be fluent in our languages to have a connection to our languages and to speak them. And we don't have to speak them perfectly, but I think, you know, each of those steps forward are really, um, are really encouraging. And, you know, I was just at ceremony last week with a bunch of my relatives and, you know, we're going around and, you know, most of the people in that room in the, um, in their introductions are using some part of the language. Maybe it's just, maybe it's Delawensi or Kowinganawal or, you know, some of those other words. And it's just really great to think that, you know, five years ago, we didn't hear any of this. None of these people were using this. And now they're using it every day when they're speaking. And so, you know, we're just building on that. And I'm really grateful to be part of it. And I'm grateful for everything that I've been able to learn with the language. Um, I think one of the things that our universities, um, particularly university like Princeton can really help with, when I think about these archives and some of these documents and resources that our communities need for, um, uh, learning what has been recorded in our languages historically, a lot of those documents, some of them are really tied up into these like intellectual property disputes. And so they are, um, a lot of our communities don't have access to those documents. They don't have access to the files or they have to pay some exorbitant fee to have access. If, even some of the language dictionaries that we have out, you know, they're a hundred plus dollars and you know, for somebody to learn their own language, they're having to shell out all this money just to have access to their own language, to resources about their language. So I think that universities can really help with some of those aspects, especially a university like Princeton that has a lot of um, a lot of power and a lot of um, uh, relationships with, you know, and being able to sort of navigate that world. 
um, as well as just also providing, um, in addition to that financial support, there's also like tech support. Like we're trying to create, for example, like a talking dictionary. None of us are IT people, um, but universities are places where, you know, they have entire departments for all of these, you know, new and um, new upcoming students who are learning um, and are, you know, looking to use those skills in a good way. And so I think you know, universities kind of thinking outside the box as to really how you can form those really strong partnerships with communities. Anishi. Um, yeah, I'm a little nervous here. <laughs> um, well, my name is Kala. Um, I come from a community called Reavy Town in New Jersey, which is a community of Lenape and Cherokee people mixed together. And um, my journey is a, uh, it's a little, it's a little, it's a short journey. I mean, I started seven years wanting to learn the language. I seen um, my relative Claire, she does a lot of um, speaking events, talking about our families. And I was just wondering what can I do to help out the community? And I was like, maybe I should learn the language because no one else is doing that. So I took it upon myself to learn the language, maybe uh, one word a week or something like that. And it gradually um, increased, but I was, I was learning the Unami language first. But then um, a few years later, um, I met with Karen at the language class up in uh, Ramapo. And uh, we did the language, um, the language, what was that called? Uh, language camp, the language camp, which took all day. And uh, we did that for, uh, for the whole weekend. And uh, I said, I, I, don't, I don't know any of these languages, um, these words. She said, um, well, let it, let it sit with you and you'll, you'll get it. So um, that was two, 2017, I think. And, um, been moving forward since then and um uh that's basically all i have to say um thank you anishik I know uh, it was talked about um, having an online dictionary. Um, University of Toronto had started that, and Bruce was the one that started working on it. So, like, I did work on it. I know other people in the community did work on it. So, I'm not sure where it is. Maybe that's a place we could start because it's already in the process. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I had a question, yeah. but if other people have uh, a question, I can bring you a mic. Um, so a lot of your suggestions about what the university can do to help um, rely on a university's power or funding. Um, and I was wondering if you all have any thoughts about what um, an individual might be able to do to assist language revitalization and if you know, thinking about an undergraduate student or a graduate student who wants to be supportive but doesn't really necessarily have the the power of the purse string yet. There we go. Okay. Um, 
as a fellow graduate student, I was really, I have an example, I guess. For, um, so the linguist that we're working with, he's also a graduate student. Yeah, he's a graduate student in linguistics at Georgetown. Um, and so, you know, how we became connected to our community is as he just had heard about us, you know, um, and decided to see what he just came out and decided, asked what he could do to help. And he was like, this is my skill set. And, you know, can I contribute something? And that's where, you know, we are right now. And he's contributed a lot. So, I mean, I think for individual students, it doesn't matter what your major is. Um, for those of you who are history majors, you can, um, if you're looking to do, you know, some types of, you know, service, you can see, you know, what sorts of things you can research, what archives you as a student may have access to that um, other, um, that other communities maybe don't have access to or aren't like situated to be able to easily access them. Um, you know, for, like I said, those people who are in computer science, you know, lend your technical skills. Um, you know, if you're in um, literature even or writing or English, um, you know, see what you can do to help maybe create educational materials. There's, you know, I'd say just go to those communities and ask what you can do to help. I just had one thing to say to Ian. No. Um, the UWGB Green Bay Packers, go Packers, um, has a graduate program that the first ever and the only uh, PhD program in Indigenous Studies and for teachers. So I started it, I made it two semesters and it was too much for me. But um, something like that is another option. Get us some grad students that are working towards a degree in Indigenous thinking. Um, my response was probably similar to what was already been said, but um, sharing resources when you come across any of your research or anything. I've had people from Manitoba send things that they find because they know I'm Lenape, so they'll send me documents and stuff. So just those kind of things is if whatever you come across and find, because we don't know they're there. We don't, you know, and even if you are researching, sometimes we're not looking in the right spot. Um, so just to share those resources is important. And that note, we need to get our resources all together because we don't we don't know what we've got. Um, most of what I got, I got from you. But <laughs> but you know, I I, I um, research and read and uh, find things that we don't have a central language page or something like that. And. Ian probably knows how to set that up. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, what, why, um, same as the uh, other saying is that um, basically we start from scratch for as far as teaching materials, like we have to make everything ourselves, like um, everything. Um, that would be, it would be helpful um like they were saying to have some sort of I don't know if it would be like a site or a page or something like that all of us teachers could benefit from or um we we like they were saying some of our dictionaries are very very old um we don't really we don't have a Muncie online talking dictionary yet um like Velma was saying, there is one in the works, and I'm not really sure where that stands today, but um, it's it's definitely coming our way. Hopefully, um, different um, apps. I would I would go in the technology direction. Um, I agree with that too. But another thing that the fact of the matter, everybody sitting up here. I don't know if you agree, but this is just my point of view. If you could leave whatever you're doing right now to dedicate your time and efforts to just working on language and culture and still be able to support your families, would you? That's what we need. Mm -hmm. That was, in fact, a pretty good note to end on. Um, we're just about at time. Um, so are there any final reflections from any of the 
panelists? No? Okay. Ani Sheik, thank you all for being here. Um, so this project transforms a two-dimensional tree drawing with corresponding historical and cultural information into an interactive visualization. It'll take the form of a web page that features a tree containing information organized thematically by its branches, roots, and trunk. Attached to each branch, there'll be a yellow, there will be yellow clickable leaves like you see in this picture. Um, that will lead readers to corresponding content that will have tags and labels that will appear with each event and will highlight other leaves that have the same labels. That way, related content can be more easily explored and connected. Okay, thank you. Um, and we hope that the interactive and organic layout of this project uh, will make complicated historical relationships intelligible, while highlighting native histories that are traditionally hidden in Eurocentric renderings of built landscapes and spaces at Princeton. Oh, now I'm trying to change slides and it's, it's not wanting to work. Hey, yeah, I'm trying to switch. Oh, okay, it worked, thank you. So this project was originally conceived by undergraduate student Jiyun Ro in Sarah Rivett's class in the fall of 2020. Uh, like Sarah said earlier, Jiyun saw another timeline of Princeton's history on the university website and reflected on how she could tell a different history, a story that emphasizes the land, its people of the past, present, and future, and the relationships that continue to transform this space. And our final project became the inspiration for this digital humanities project. And so you can see June's original uh, tree timeline with information points on the left and how after several meetings with folks from NASIP, from the Center for Digital Humanities and Busy Lab, we were able to develop a concept uh, that, brought, that was brought to life by student artist Lola Constantino, who added color and texture to June's design. And we chose the sycamore tree as the tree to represent this history because of the multiple layers of meaning it has to this space. For one, the sycamores you see in front of the McLean house in these photographs have local lore for having been planted in honor of the repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766. But perhaps more importantly for our purposes, the sycamores are a native species to this region and have several traditional uses in Lenape communities as Ian shared with us earlier. And we thought that highlighting the indigenous histories of this tree that have been covered by colonial histories aptly represented the work that we're hoping to do in this project. So now I'd like to tell you about the different content components of the project, um, beginning with the leaves and branches section. 
As you can see in the picture to the right, each main branch has a theme, including land and waters, communities, removals, resistance and resurgence, the university, and the newly added branch philosophies. So I'll quickly go through each of the branch themes um, and give examples of some of the content that you might find on them. And no pressure to read what's on the slides, um, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what um, the leaves might look like and how the tagging system works. The Land and Waters branch introduces the region that Lena Pocking the region of Lenapaking and the histories of cohabitation, treaty making and dispossession that have marked this land since the arrival of European settlers in the early 1600s. As you can see here, uh, this section includes content such as the walking purchase of 1737 when the Penn brothers stole 1.2 million acres of Lenape land, um, an action which shaped Lenape British relations for decades to follow. And you can notice the, the tag at the bottom, um, which connect each content leaf with other leaves containing similar themes, such as land claims, for example, that you'll see across the different branches. The community section highlights how Lenape people establish themselves in different groups. It focuses on the actions and formation of different Lenape communities and how they related with one another. And as you can see, we, and when I say we, I mean mostly Izzy Lockhart, who did the bulk of the historical research, um, used a wide range of sources for this material, uh, some of which include the work of Ian and Chief Mark Peters. The removals branch includes different instances of forced removal and migration that Lenape people have experienced from 1690 through the 1860s. Um, this branch is very similar to the communities branch, but focuses more on the, the motion of communities due to colonialism. The resistance and resurgence section represents when Lenape people fought back against colonialism. It includes moments such as when Lenape and other native people limited settler access to lands, petitioned for compensation for lost hunting and fishing rights in New Jersey, and when communities gained independent tribal status. And the university section discusses the history of Princeton University, particularly as it relates to its land claims and to Princeton's Lenape and other indigenous students. The section begins at the university's founding in 1747, including the lack of consultation with Lenape communities, and continues to the present, including significant events held by Princeton indigenous student groups, such as the natives at Princeton. And finally, the, the last branch philosophies is our newest branch, um, and it focuses on the interchange of ideas that has occurred since contact particularly how indigenous philosophies and critiques of European culture and political structures influenced European philosophies. Um, this will be the only section that is not centered on solely the Lenape or Lenape hoking, um, but we think that it's an important addition to the project since the, the contact narrative so often tells us how Europeans affected indigenous ways of life, um, but not so much the other way around. And although most of our con content at this point um, is from around the Enlightenment period, uh, we're hoping to expand this branch to include influential indigenous thinkers from the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. So the root section will reveal the history of the project, its inspiration, contributors, iterations, and sources. Um, and you might see on the slide that Originally, the roots were supposed to include different components of Lenape culture, um, but we, as we continued developing the content, it felt like we were making too many uh, decisions about what aspects of Lenape culture to include. And um, since the those of us who are working on the project aren't Lenape, uh, we decided it's not really our place to make those decisions. So instead, we decided to make the the roots, a reflection of the makers and the history of the project to 
emphasize that this isn't supposed to be a definitive Lenape history, um, but rather a project growing from the efforts and interests of a group of students, faculty, and staff who want to see these relationships con continue to flourish and to continue to learn from um, Lenape community members. And so we're currently in the process of figuring out what kind of material we would like to include in the trunk. But we think we'd like to use this space to highlight um, the ongoing relationship between the land and its stewards. Because without these relationships and moments for togetherness, like um, the symposium, the tree loses its meaning. And just like a, a trunk with, or a tree without a trunk. Um, so I, I don't know if we'll have time at the end of the presentation because um, it is getting a little late, but um, I would love to hear if anyone has any thoughts about um, the best way to visualize the relationships between Lenape communities and Princeton in this space. Um, and our goal is to continue updating um, this project over time. So it could definitely be something um, if we want to discuss the symposium and the seed farm and other instances and, and spaces for relationship building. So as you can see, I've had to rely on artistic renderings of the project from last fall, actually, um, for the sake of the presentation, because our web developers are currently hard at work building this interactive visualization from the ground up. Uh, we had originally tried using pre-existing programs for the project, but realized that for accessibility and usability reasons um, that we needed more technical support. So this past spring, we received a grant from the Center for the Digital Humanities that are making all of our technical dreams possible. Um, and so although visually at the moment, it looks like a lot of coding, uh, we're hoping that this will be a major enhancement to the project. Um, and we plan for the project to find a permanent home on the Princeton Indigenous Studies website. Um, and But like I said, like a growing tree, we are hoping to build in the capacity to continue to edit um, and add to this tree as relationship um, relationships grow and experiences like the symposium um, hopefully continue to happen in this space. And so if you have any suggestions or input or criticisms or critiques or any of it, I've got thick skin. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, like I said, my name's Keely Smith. You'll see me around the symposium for the next couple of days. Um, and you can also email me at keelys at princeton.edu. Um, our project director, Jeff Hempley, and I would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, so like I said, I don't know if we have a little bit of time now. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear feedback and it's just such a special opportunity to be in the same room with so many experts. So thank you so much. Thank you, Keely. And thank you for all the work you did helping to make the symposium um, so beautifully organized. I really appreciate it. I was thinking a lot about Karen because Karen loved to make us do projects in class. <laughs> right? um, and I was thinking if she was here, I feel like she'd be like, what about the language? Like, did you all think about incorporating the language in some ways into what was happening with the tree? And like, what was that thought process like? And is that something you might come back to? I think that's definitely something that as we continue adding to the content of the project that we'll want to do more of. Um, I know that as Izzy was doing the research for this content, um, she did try to include as, as many language um, components as she could and like the suggestion to use the spelling for when I'm talking um, in this way instead of uh, a way that is more common right um, and so I think that that's definitely a, a goal that we want to move forward with um, but I think also um, maybe trying to find experts if, if anyone has you know the, the time or the space or the interest um, to you know, help guide us in that way, since none of us are, you know, learning the Lenape language, um, you know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm already learning another indigenous language, <laughs> I'm doing my best, um, but anyway, so we would love input, and I mean, I think that's a really great point, that especially since the, the title of this project 
uh, begins with using the Lenape language, we should really push forward with that and make sure that it's present throughout the project. Thank you. Uh -huh. I don't want to hit space, but just to build on that, I was just thinking about Here, I think I Zoom, right? Okay. Uh, just to build on that, I was just thinking about um, Ian's natural dictionary, you know, and maybe that could be a partnership because we left off with the last session thinking about reciprocity and what we can do um, in terms of, you know, resource support, but also on an individual knowledge level. So maybe that could, we could find a creative way to link, um, you know, some of the work that, that you're doing with a natural dictionary with, with this project to bring out some of the vocabulary. I mean, here. the information that you shared about the sycamore having the, the meaning for boat, right. we weren't aware of that. You know, we had found that sycamores were culturally relevant. Um, and I think I had read about how it, um, is used to make a, a kind of tea or drink, but I knew nothing about the boats. So I think that that kind of language knowledge could really add so much depth to this project. If again, if you have the the time and the availability, which I know you don't have a lot of time. So, <laughs> um, yes, can you bring the mic to her? When you mentioned the word link, it started me thinking. Maybe what you would like to do, you know, because people spoke about the need for access mm -hmm. to documents and um, archives that we don't have mm -hmm. uh, access to. I wonder if you couldn't put links within that people could click on and then go and be able to access some of that information that perhaps they would not have had uh, access to. I think that is a really fantastic suggestion and something that we've been talking about both in um, the circles of this project, but also with the general indigenous studies at Princeton website is building some kind of repository where, you know, links to these resources that people might want would be available. Um, and so I think that that you know, as we received this new grant um, and have been like rebuilding technically this project, um, that'll be something to come back to about whether we want to include those links in the tree project or if we want to create a, a separate page. I know we talked about maybe linking the repository page to the library. So I, I think that that's definitely something that we should put a lot of energy into because there's definitely interest and in, you know, if, if that would be something that's useful, then. You, you know, like in a bibliography, you know, you give, okay, I found this here and, da, 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 you know, so often people don't know where to look. So if you can cross reference, well, this is where that information lives, mm -hmm. you know, that type. If I can just piggyback on that very, very briefly, um, I'm thinking about how much this project costs. And I don't mean this as a criticism at all. I'm just thinking about how institutions allocate resources and how they think about it. And sometimes institutions will say, we can't make that stuff available. We pay for those subscriptions. We can, you know, that's expensive, right? Um, and so, I mean, I'll put it on you at all, Keely, but the institutions need to be thinking about where are the priorities and what what kind of, what, 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 are, the, what are the good things that are generated? And a project like this has all this potentiality. For example, if it's enlarged in the way that um, Tony was describing, as long as the resourcing is there um, to, to open doors and, and facilitate access and lower the uh, and lower the barriers to access and to improve the availability of resources. I'm still remembering, I think it was Kristen who had said, um, people teaching the language have to start at the beginning and that's, you know, it, making your own resources. And it's similar for history, right? So, anyway, sorry, it's a little bit polemical, but. I don't know if there's a place where advocacy could fit in that because you are you're the younger generation you have more energy than i have and i acknowledge that and you got that fire uh which is important so i believe you know students in undergrad and, and graduate programs have that ability to push and be allies where uh us who are in later like middle age 
are busy with the you know conquer tree uh, sorry content creation and and doing the work of raising families and things like that um i think that the advocacy part is important because as i look around the room um you know my question to institutions and schools is who is actually present so missing i think in this room would be representatives or people from uh visual arts here at princeton because there's at least three people i can pick out here who could tell you stuff about art in muncie culture uh there's several language speakers in the room which has been well addressed in the last two years but also history are there representatives from princeton history department here who who might benefit from the information or go oh you know i didn't know that or geography or geology like it's it's a expanding out to to share that wealth of knowledge and and i think that you know very much so in the under, undergraduate program by oh you know really interested in taking that uh, native literature course right oh you know got to take that it's the power of of that generation and and those students to be able to spread that news around Right. And that's, I think that's just that good practice where this symposium has really taken off. You know, here's where, who's, here's who we can invite next time. Right. Hey, did you know, come on down. You might, you might learn some things. Anishi. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Oh, there's some, um, uh, well, Rachel snake says Nula Malsi to Ian, Molly, Velma and Kristen shout out from the north okay and there is a question uh a hand raised from susan sandoval can you hear us susan do you want to ask a question yes so what it's susanna sandoval Susanna, sorry it's okay um i currently serve as a human rights commissioner within the u.n permanent forum on indigenous issues and we've been having the debate around language acquisition uh, and encouragement uh, to preserve our languages. I've been doing this work for um, in the museum sector uh, since I started my scholarly work in the 80s. Uh, and I'm Purepecha uh, and have done a fair amount of work around the country, but I'm still learning. And um, I wanted to just thank everybody for sharing um, their thoughts uh, today, I, it overlapped with another conference that I did internationally for um, the Eagle and Condor Prophecy. It was an intergenerational gathering. Uh, but I, I listened to the previous comments of, of this work and having worked for a, an institution of higher education and also in the museum sector, I think that there is room to ask Princeton to step forward um, by directly, a lot of the presidents of universities, um, I've been based in Colorado for the last year and in the Southwest. And so uh, the Northeast is, is a different region. I'm, I grew up in the Midwest um, and this is a there is no time like this to um, ask for the resources that are already there. Uh, to reallocate those resources. And while I can understand, I'm, I, I am, uh, a bridge in between generations, um, but I still have fire in my belly. Um, and if there's anything that I can do for writing a letter to the president, um, as I have to many other presidents of institutions in order to reallocate funding uh, to allow our elders and our cultural bearers to have a scholarship um, and or fellowship to serve as uh, experts in our culture, uh, and encourage that to be part of a core curriculum. I would be happy to do that. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, there were there was a push, and in the 90s, a push for American studies. And American studies um, was being challenged because those of us who questioned what was being referred to as America um, and the inclusion of our people's histories and our, you know, our tragedies, our triumphs, our challenges, and our successes, um, this is a time where we need to push forward. And so if there's anything that I can do or, you know, build momentum, um, the Smithsonian, you know, is, is not that far from you all. Um, 
several of the institutions aren't, and I'm pretty sure that Princeton also has other scholarly museum activities going on. So be happy to help bridge those gaps of communication. Thank you. Thank you. And then there's a, a question from Rachel Snake. I have a suggestion or a suggestion. Since teachings are given orally, can we gather more land-based style, go canoeing, use Muncie language to identify objects? So it's very similar to the methodology that, that Ian's been talking about. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, it's like that's a that's a that's an easy answer for me. It's yeah, and but it's also tied to that, you know, the planning and making sure that the preparation's done in advance and things like that. Uh, for next year, uh, gas me in a month. <laughs> we put on the spot here. So next year, we're hoping to go from Big Ben to Moravian Town. Oh, for here. That's, yeah, that's, uh, it, you know, in terms of looking at rivers here locally in the Princeton area, in order to get a better sense of, you know, the, the natural environment and what our people would have used the rivers for or, or thought about what they've seen. So that's, um, yeah, I don't know. If, yeah, 2023 is going to be a packed year. So hold tight. Wrap up. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone for all of your suggestions. It really helped um, us think about how to grow this project in a way that is supported to our audiences who hopefully might be Lenape and, you know, could be supported in uh, finding documents and to Princeton students who have the, you know, the fire to hold it. So I'm really grateful for uh, the time that you've given me. <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, Phil. I really appreciate the project itself and also the way in which it encourages us to push harder. Like, I think that was a really good conversation and I'm hoping that we'll be able to do good things for it.